first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, how long the precinct you seen him? Yeah. Yeah. You're sure he didn't move out? Well, who told you that, lady? Yeah. You are in the muster room at the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send an officer around a talk Yeah, he'll be there right away. You just wait for him. 21st precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them if they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I am captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. After I had turned out the platoon, which consisted of the 54 men who would patrol the precinct for the next eight hours, I went to my office where Ezra D. Winkler, the precinct youth patrolman, was waiting to confer with me. The end of the school year brings a variety of changes to the method of policing the precinct. We were preparing for them. Meanwhile, the ordinary routine of patrolling the precinct went on. Patrolman Paul Vaccaro, assigned to post 17, had finished his duty at a school crossing near PS 79 at 9 a.m. He went to the nearest call box and rang in. Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, instructed him to walk to a dry goods store on 3rd Avenue and admonished the proprietor for failing to close the transom over his front door during the preceding night. In complying with Lieutenant Gorman's instructions, he walked past a brownstone rooming house where a woman he knew to be the landlady was sweeping down the front stoop. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, officer. Yes? I want to ask you a question. Yes, ma'am, what is it? I'm Mrs. Catherine Neal. I own the house here. Yes, I know. I rent our furnished room. Yes? Well, something's been bothering me. Yes, Maybe it's all my imagination, I don't know, but there's a man that lives on the second floor, Mr. Lowfield. What about him? Well, I haven't seen him since Friday. Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I haven't seen him. Maybe he's away. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't think so. He's lived here over six years, and he's never been away. Never. Was he paid up in his rent? Oh, yes, yes, yes. He's paid up. Paid up right to the minute. You can say anything else you want to about him, but he's regular about that. Well, tell me something. He does have peculiar habits. Like, for instance... No one ever sees him during the daytime. I suppose he's up there sleeping in the daytime. Mm-hmm. But 8 o'clock every night, he comes downstairs and he walks out the door, and he's out all night, almost. Very peculiar habit. Well, if he doesn't And the most any... peculiar thing of all is that when I didn't see him, yesterday afternoon I went up and knocked on the door. I thought maybe he was sick or something. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody that's got no friends and no one at all. I thought maybe he needed help. He didn't answer. Did you open the door to his room? Oh, no, 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 no. I wouldn't do that. Besides, I don't think I could get a key in there anyway. He's got the keyhole blocked with something, I think. It's not locked from the inside, is it? Why, it might be the key that's in the keyhole from the inside, that is. If it's locked from the inside, why, he must be in there. Look, maybe, uh, maybe we better go up and take a look, Mrs. Neal, huh? Yes, maybe we better. My goodness. Just let me get this trash up. It'll take a second. All right. Oh, tell me something. Uh, how old a man is Mr. Lowfield? Huh? Oh, in his middle sixties, I suppose. About sixty-five. I never asked him. I never asked him much. He's not one to talk. Just ignores everyone. Ignores everyone around. Well, what's his first name? Edwin. It's Edwin Lowfield. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't have to do for now. People walk by here and they throw everything they can think of on my stoop. Couldn't throw their cigarettes and papers in the gutter. They have to throw them on my feet. Oh, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I just leave the boom right here. It's this way. Mm-hmm. The second floor. What uh, What does he do? What do you mean? Well, when he gets out at night, does he uh, does he go to work? Well, I don't think so. I don't think he works at all. 
Well, what does he live on? Well, who knows? Social Security, maybe. He's got the money to pay the rent. That way. Maybe a person. I don't know. I never asked him. It's that one. Now, look, uh, you don't know whether he has any family or any friends? Well, none that I saw. I never saw any of them. Yeah, the, that's the key in the door, all right. Oh, that won't do you any good. I've been trying that since yesterday afternoon. No one you spoke to show him go out? Huh? No, no one. And he's never gone away on a trip for a weekend since he's lived here in six years? Never. No. Listen, you don't think he's... Oh, no. Oh, that would be awful. Now, look, you say no one saw him go out, and he was in the habit of going out every night. Now, the key's in the door, and it's locked on the inside. Oh, my goodness. The poor old man. Look, I think we ought to kick it in. If that's all right with you, of course. Will he do much damage? Who's going to pay for it? Well, I think one good kick will take care of that old-time lock. Do you think we ought to? Well, the door is your property, Mrs. New. Well, maybe we better. All right, now, you just stand back over there. One good kick ought to take care of it. Be careful, though. Yeah, I'll try. All right, that does it. You certainly can kick, I'll say that. $700 in this one. 
Oh, that's too bad. Only 4,000 in here. And last but not least in this one, $9,450. Well, he sure spread it around, didn't he? It was mine, Captain. I keep it all in one place. Those look like stock certificates, don't they? Take a look at them. Uh, yes, sir. See, uh, 500 shares of Consolidated Edison. 200 shares of AT&T. 200 shares Pennsylvania Railroad. 500 shares Columbia Broadcasting System. 250 shares DuPont. And so on, so on, so on, so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and a whole stack of defense bonds. Yeah. Captain, I've come to the conclusion this fellow was loaded. Well, I picked up the suitcase. Let's take it over and get an inventory. Yes. Oh, uh, here's some more you can put on that inventory, Vaquero. Some more what? Some more money? Yes, bank uh, books and security. That makes it uh, $9,865 in cash, Captain. In the one drawer. $9,865? And there's more. All right. When you get it totaled, enter it in your book and I'll sign it. Yes, sir, I'll do this. Then get to work on this stuff. Captain, can I talk to you for a minute? Yes, Miss Neal, of course. Every one of those bills has to be listed by serial number, you know. Yes, sir. Yes, Miss Neal. He was worth a fortune. That's what it's beginning to look like. But what happens to it? All this money, I mean. Well, we take it to the station house. The desk officer enters it in the blotter. And it gets sent down to the departmental property clerk. I mean, who gets it? Who gets it eventually? Well, he might have left a will. I don't know who he'd leave his money to. He didn't have anybody. He told me time and time again he didn't have anybody. No one in the world. No one at all? Well, I think he did have a sister. But she died four or five years ago. Yes, mm-hmm. Four or five years ago. Uh, do you know the sister's name? No, I hadn't any idea. He never mentioned it. I just remember that one day I saw him coming down the stairs in the morning. About 10 o'clock or 10.30. Mm-hmm. Well, he hadn't been living here too long then, only about a year, but I'd never seen him come out in the daytime before. I said, where are you going, Mr. Lowfield? He said, to a funeral. Yes, he said his sister died. Ah, uh-huh. I see. It was out in Long Island someplace. I don't know. I said I was sorry to hear the news, and he went out the door. And that's the last he ever mentioned of her. The last he ever mentioned of her. Uh, did he get much mail here, Mrs. Neal? Mail? I don't think he had one letter, not one letter since he'd lived here. Nothing? Well, I ought to know. I get the mail every morning. I put it on that marble table downstairs in the hall. The tenants come by there and pick it up, and I go through it every day to take out what's mine when I get it. I can honestly say that I've never seen one letter to get Mr. Lowfield. Not even one? Not one. To the best of my recollection. Uh-huh. Well, suppose he didn't leave a will. If you don't find it here, I don't think he did. What happens then? Well, then the estate is handled by the public administrator. What's that? Well, he's a city official whose job it is to administer the estates of people who die without leaving a will. Oh. He'll try to find relatives and claimants to the estate, and the estate will be disposed of by the surrogate's court. Well, he's not going to find any relatives. As far as claimants are concerned, Mr. Lowfield didn't owe anyone. He never bought anything, so how could he owe anyone? Well, in any case, it'll all be settled according to law. You know, I could really classify myself as a criminal. Could you? Yes. I've taken care of that poor old man for six years now. As a matter of fact, he's made promises to me time and time again that I could have anything I wanted that he had. Just for the favors I've done it. I gave him food. I got clothes for him. I saw that his room was kept clean. He told me anything of his that I wanted I could have. But he never paid the attention to him. I didn't think he had anything. I just did it out of the goodness of my heart. I think I have a rightful claim. Don't you, Captain? Uh, that's something I can't pass judgment on, Miss Neal. Well, what do you think I ought to do? Get a lawyer? You'll have to decide that for yourself. That poor old man. That poor, poor old man. You are listening to 21st Precinct. A factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. You want to go to church, but you can't. On the church door, there's a sign stating entrance forbidden. Your ministers and priests and rabbis have been taken away. Your Bible has been burned. 
You're not allowed to own a crucifix or a St. Christopher's medal or a mezuzah. Your religion, all religions, are forbidden by order of the government. A bad dream? Yes, that's all it could be for an American citizen. Because he's guaranteed the right to worship anywhere, anytime, and in any way he chooses. Some governments allow their citizens these privileges. Others deny them. But we Americans tell our government that it has no jurisdiction over religion, whatever it may be. We say so in good, clear language. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It's part of our Bill of Rights, our Constitution. Just 16 words, signed by a few men 165 years ago. These 16 words are your assurance that freedom of religion will be preserved for you, for your children, and for generations to come. The First Amendment, freedom of religion, it is one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. Within another half hour, a representative of the medical examiner's office arrived. He made an examination of the body of John W. Lowfield and reported, pending an autopsy, that death was apparently due to natural causes. Patrolman Vaccaro, the first officer on the scene, placed a UF-95 identification tag on the wrist of the body, and it was taken to the Bellevue morgue. All the property of the deceased in the room had been collected and inventoried. It amounted to $14,655 in cash, bank books from four savings institutions showing deposits totaling $31,456, United States savings and defense bonds with a face value of $47,250, and other securities worth more than $185,000 in the current market. The totals were rechecked in the presence of the civilian witness, entered by Patrolman Vaccaro in his memorandum book, which was signed by both myself and Sergeant Waters. The property was then taken to the station house by Patrolman Vaccaro and turned over to the desk officer for transmittal to the property clerk of the department. In the meantime, Detective William Novak of the 21st Squad had been assigned by Lieutenant King to make an investigation in order to locate either relatives or close friends of the deceased. He interviewed the landlady, Mrs. Neal, to secure whatever information she had. He examined the papers and documents found in the room. And at 2.10 in the afternoon, his task took him to Astoria in Queens, where he went into a new apartment building and rode the self-service elevator to the fourth floor, where he walked down the hall to apartment 4D. Uh... <clears throat> Is this the residence of Mr. George Bookham? Yes, who is it? Is Mr. Bookham Hall on the police officer? Yes. What's the matter? I'm Detective Novak of the 21st Squad. Is Mr. Bookham home? Yes, he's here. What's the matter? I'd like to talk to him. Are you Mrs. Bookham? Yes, that's right. Come in. Thank you. George! Got the ball game on in there. Uh-huh. George! What? Someone here to see you. Who? A detective. All right. George Yank fan. Mr. Bookham. Uh-huh. Don't you think that it took Reynolds out of there, Alma? He walked another man. He's staying my ghost. You're a detective, huh? Yes, sir, that's right. William Novak of the 21st Squad in Manhattan. Uh, what can I do for you? Mr. Bookham, do you have an uncle named Edwin Lowfield? Yes, that's right. It's uh, my mother's brother. Uh, lives in the East 70s in New York. Well, I don't know where he lives. I haven't seen him in years. I think he did live there, George. What's the trouble? Afraid I got some bad news for you, Mr. Bookham. Yeah? He was found in his room this morning. Apparently he had a heart attack. Is he uh, dead? Yes, sir, that's right. I'm sorry. Well, uh, too bad about him. From what I remember, he was a pretty nice guy. Yeah. Well, what are we supposed to do about him? We'd like Mr. Bookham to come over to Bellevue and identify the body. Why? Just a matter of procedure, sir. I always try to get a close relative or friend in cases like this. Notify them. Well, I'm not what you would call a close relative. From what I can learn, you're the closest, aren't you? Well, I guess I am the closest, but it's just my uncle, and I haven't seen him in years. Not since my mother's funeral, as a matter of fact. Uh, look, I'm sorry and all that, but I don't think it's any of my responsibility. Who haven't heard from in years. No, that's right. Now, I've got my own family. I've got my wife and two kids. Well, what am I supposed to do about it? What do they want me to do? Arrange for the funeral and uh, uh, everything? 
Well, we thought you might like to, being the closest relative. Well, suppose he was my third cousin or something like that. Would you expect it if I was still the closest relative? We'd notify you. Do you still live in the first room? Yes, ma'am, that's right. Well, I don't see why they expect us to take care of the funeral expenses and all that. We've got no money for that. He doesn't mean that much to us. Nobody asked you to take care of any expenses. Well, somebody will if we get involved in making arrangements and all that. Don't go, George. Don't be a fool. No, i got to be at work at 4 o'clock anyway. I work at the Hotel Coronet over in Manhattan. Oh, yeah, but you still have time to come to Bellevue and make an identification. Don't do it, George. You'll only get involved. You've got no responsibility. No, that's right. No, I I, I don't want to get involved. I, I, I don't want to get stuck for any of these expenses. I don't think you will, Mr. Bookham. It appears your uncle had a little money. Did he? Yes. I hope it's enough to cover the funeral expenses. Yes, ma'am, it is. And then some. Well, uh, how much was that? Well, Mr. Bookham, we're not all together sure. There might be more than was in his room. Well, what was in his room? Oh, well, it was cash and passbooks and securities worth about $275,000. <gasps> $275,000. Yes, sir, that's right. Are you sure it's my uncle? I can sure, George. Well, there was a picture of a woman in his room in the drawer. It had, to my darling brother, written on it from Margaret. If that was my mother's name, Margaret. The photographer was from Jamaica. I checked him out. I looked up his records, and I got the address where your mother formerly lived. And first hell. Yeah, I went around the building there and spoke to the super. He remembered that you worked for the coronet in New York. I checked the name there, and they gave me this address. If they need you to make an identification and arrange for the funeral, George, I think you walked to. After all, you're his closest relative. Oh, sure, Alma. I intend to do everything I can. As I remember him, George, he was a nice old man, really nice. He was always good to me when I was a kid. And he was crazy about my mother. I'll do anything I can to help you, uh, Detective um, Novak. Yeah, yeah, and anything. I, I just want to be of all the assistance I can. I, I want to help. Well, you can come over to Bellevue with me and identify him. And then what? Just so the medical examiner releases the body. You can make any arrangements for the funeral you want. Well, where's the money? It was taken to the 21st Precinct Station House. It'll be safe there, won't it? Couldn't be much safer. Gets entered in the blotter and turned over to the property clerk at the department. Oh, uh, no aspersions, man. I was just concerned. I'm the closest relative, you know. Mr. and Mrs. Bookham left immediately with Detective Novak for Bellevue Morgue in order to identify the body of George Bookham's uncle. During this time, I had been out on patrol of the precinct in sector car number four, and I returned to the station house at 3.40 p.m., in time to turn out the platoon for the night tour at four. I got out of the car, walked up the front steps, and into the muster room where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was now on telephone switchboard duty. Hello, Captain. Oh, what's doing, Sergeant? Nothing much, sir. Just read a call from the press about the old man and the money. Oh. I referred them all up to the detectives. Good. Oh, and uh, Lieutenant King said he'd like to see you when you get back in the house. All right, bring him upstairs and tell him I'm back. Yes, sir. I'll uh, sign the blotter. Yes, sir. Hello, Red. Honey, very surprised to take the power. This is Sergeant Waters on P.S., Whitey. Yes, Sergeant. Lieutenant King wanted to know when Captain Kennelly got back in the house. He's back. You want to talk to the lieutenant or shall I tell him? You tell him. Okay. How'd you get hold of Lieutenant King, Sergeant? I spoke to Howard upstairs, the captain. He fell in the lieutenant's your back. Okay. Uh, there's something I want you to do for me. Yes, sir. Uh, 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Patrolman Vaccaro, Box 14. Uh, Lieutenant Gorman wants to talk to you, Vaccaro. Hold the phone. Yes, sir. Uh, Vaccaro's ringing in, Lieutenant. Okay, I'll talk to him, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Captain. Uh, I'm giving a talk at the Lennox Hill Lions Club next week, Sergeant. Yes, sir. And uh, I want to dwell on the connection between parking regulations and safety. Now, would you get together with a 124 man and dig out some recent aided and accident cards that deal with accidents which are the direct result of illegal parking or double parking or anything of that nature? Yes, sir. I want three or four good examples to illustrate the points I have to make. Yes, sir, I understand. Uh, see what you can do. Hello, Captain. Oh, Matt. Lieutenant King? Oh, Sergeant. It's been a rather interesting development in that Lowfield case, Captain. You know the man who died with all the money in his room? Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll be in my office, Sergeant. Yes, sir. An attorney called me a little while ago. What? 
Oh, an attorney called me, too, before I went out on patrol. Said he represents Mrs. Neal, the landlady. He wants to put in a claim for services against the estate. He wanted some information. I told him we had nothing to do with that, and he'd have to check with the public administrator. Well, this was a different attorney, Captain. But first, let me get you up to date. Novak found Mr. Lowfield's nephew, a man named George Bookham. The nephew identifies the body of his uncle, the nephew, and his wife. Well, what about this other attorney that called you? Do you remember the mailing address and the stock certificates was in care of? Yeah. Five or six names in the firm. I put in a call down there. The girl who answered the phone didn't know anything about it. Said she'd check around. About an hour ago, this lawyer called me back. His name was Hopwell. Yeah. He told me the old man had made some shrewd investments over the years. <laughs> that's obvious. Yeah, but that's not the big news. He said that Lowfield did have a will. Oh? It doesn't name either the nephew and his wife or Mrs. Neal. Well, that's going to be a big blow. Yes, sir. Made no will. He left everything to Columbia University. Look, if uh, Lowfield was such a smart investor, did the lawyer have any idea what he was doing with all that cash in his room? No, sir. He was just as surprised at it as we were. He knew about the savings accounts and the war bonds. He had no idea about the cash. Mm-hmm. Captain Kane? Excuse me. Well, no, that. Captain? No, that. This is Mr. and Mrs. George Bookham. Captain Connelly. Captain? Hello. How do you do? That's Lieutenant King. Lieutenant? How are you? Mrs. Bookham? Thank you, sir. I'd just been down to Bellevue, Lieutenant. Mr. Bookham identified the body that had been located with his uncle. It was him, all right. As soon as we can, we're going to have him moved to a funeral parlor in Astoria. He'll have a nice service. Well, it'll be fine. Very nice service. Mr. and Mrs. Bookham wanted to come up here and talk to you, sir, about the property that was found in Mr. Lopez's room. Well, there's no sense talking to me about it. It's been inventoried, entered in the records, and sent down to the property clerk's office at 400 Broom Street. I told him it would be well taken care of. Oh, we don't have any doubt that it'll be well taken care of. I I, I just thought I'd, uh, like, uh, uh, look at it and check over the list of what was there. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, but I don't have authority to give you permission to do that. And uh, it's out of my hands now down at the property clerk's office. Well, I don't see why we can't do it. After all, it's ours. George is the closest relative to him. It'll all be ours. How do I go about getting permission? Well, anytime there's a question of disposition of an estate, the surrogate's court must rule on it. Any such property can't be released without a court order. Well, we didn't expect you to release it. We just wanted to inspect the inventory that you said you, you had. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what you do. Yes? Yeah? Uh, Detective Novak will take you to the desk officer right over there and introduce you. He'll give you the address of the property clerk and tell you who to see down there. They'll have all the information downtown. The property clerk is at 400 Broom Street. I don't know why there's all this trouble. After all, the money will be ours. As I said, that has to be determined by the court. Uh, Novak, yes. Can you take them over to talk to Lieutenant Gorman? Yes. Do you want to come this way, please? Well, thank you, Captain. Thank you. You're welcome. Right over here. I thought you were going to tell them that. Uh, I was waiting for you to do it, Captain. Well, that's the court, John. I figured it could wait. Their second piece of shocking news in one day might be just too much. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Who? Well, what happened? He fell off a truck. Yeah. Yeah. How old the boy? Oh, now wait a minute. Exactly where is this? No, don't touch him. Just tell him I'm sending the officers right over there. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, City of New York. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.